Next, we'd like to present Smart Girl Politics, Engage, Educate, and Empower Award. In this award, we present the two, Deborah Burlingame. <laughs> Deborah is the sister of Charles F. Chick Burlingame III, pilot of American Airlines Flight 77, which crashed into the Pentagon on September 11th. She's the co-founder of 9-11 Families for a Safe and Strong America, the director of the National September 11th Memorial and Museum Foundation at the World Trade Center. She has published featured articles for the Wall Street Journal and other publications on national security issues, including the Patriot Act, the National Security Agency Terrorism and Surveillance Program, Al-Qaeda and the Saddam Hussein regime, the 9-11 Commission, Aviation Security, and the Guantanamo detainees. She has testified before the Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives on terrorism-related issues and works with the Center for Security Policy as an advocate for its domestic terror program aimed at Iran, Syria, Syria, excuse me, Sudan, and North Korea. Deborah has appeared on NBC's Today Show, Fox's O'Reilly Factor, Fox and Friends, Your World with Neil Cabuto, Annie and Combs, CNN and Larry, Larry King when he was with us, and Polos on, Polos on, and NBC's Hardball with Chris Matthews. Deborah was formerly a producer of Core TV, where she covered dozens of civil and criminal legal proceedings, ranging from the O.J. Simpson trial and the Clinton impeachment hearings to the Microsoft antitrust case. She wrote pieces for broadcast on constitutional appellate, appellate cases, consumer law, and legal news, and helped launch a documentary series involving cold criminal cases. Prior to her career in television, she was an attorney in New York City. Deborah is a graduate of New York University and the Cardinal School of Law. I emailed Deborah Perlingame about two years ago, and um, I introduced myself via email. And I felt that she should know who I was, because I had a story to tell as well. And then I wrote to her my story about my brother-in-law, and my father's plane that crashed five days, seven, two months after 9-11. And she wrote back, oh my god. And we instantly connected via email, and we've been friends ever since. I don't see her often. We shoot each other emails, but she has a Spanish interview. She's like, Rosa, can you cover this for me? I got it. <laughs> okay. I am always, I will always be here for you. Smart Girl Politics um, is always looking for whom to give this award to um, during the year. And I said, well, we do it nationally. I was the recipient last year for my activism. So part of being a good steward is to pass it forward. I said to Diane that we are to give an award for our local activism champion. And I can think of no one more deserving, though as simple as this award may be, you should know that there are 50,000 women who support you the Smart Girl organization, after you were introduced last year, loves you. And they love your New York humor, especially the Mississippi contingency. <laughs> and well, I, all I can say is that on 9-11, we were both at the same place at different times. I was with my sister, and you were there with the former president. Tells you where we're at. <laughs> but nonetheless, I turn on the TV after a long day, and there's Deborah Burlingame speaking to Neil Cabuda. And the first and the only words I heard were, my God, you're relentless. And I shouted, yes, she is. Thank God, she's relentless. Because she doesn't let it go. She will never let it go. It was her brother. It is, as we talked about privately, right? It is our pain, and unless you're a 9-11 family member, you have no idea what it's like day in and day out. My friend, I love her. She's the best, Deborah Burlingame. And on behalf of Smart Girl Politics, we would like to present to you this Simple, the meaningful award, Deborah Brony.
happy to be, I'm thrilled to be here, and I have to really learn how to do that tweeting stuff, because 50,000 people kind of passing it on, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, so thank you, Diane, for hosting us. Um, Kristen, if you're still here, great uh, rendition of uh, one of our most important songs, Reverend Croft. Craft. I wish you'd been my minister when I was a kid. <laughs> I slept through a lot of sermons. I, you're pretty good. Um, Mayor uh, Murray, uh, Councilman Hall um, Halloran, and of course, Andy, my new buddy. Um, he's a force to be reckoned with down at Ground Zero, and he's really important. We need him because, um, I'm going to just move this out of the way. <coughs> Because we have a problem at Ground Zero uh, that is very emblematic of what's going on, not just all over the country, but all over the world. Um, I was asked, I, I started getting um, media inquiries in preparation for the 10th anniversary about a year ago. Um, thank you. Uh, international press started preparing its content. It's a big production. The media always thinks in terms of five years, ten years. Um, I used to work in the media and I used to have that mindset too. It amuses me now, not in a good way, because uh, the enemy doesn't think in anniversaries. Al-Qaeda and their, all of their affiliates, the Islamists and the Wahhabis, they think in terms of generations, right. um, centuries even. And uh, they only care about the 10th anniversary because they know we do. Uh, but uh, some of the questions that I heard, I started getting uh, a year ago, and of course it intensified as we got closer and closer to the 10th anniversary, and I know you heard this, um, was, you know, these, the, the reflection questions, are we safer? Um, is 9-11 over? They call it the 9-11 decade. Is it now over? Um, but the two that really, uh, saddened me, because um, they told me that we have a lot of work to do, were these. Did we overreact? And was the country gripped by a, a collective hysteria? This is the kind of, you know, the phrase never forget, um, as one of the firefighters who was gravely injured and survived said, is never forget just a slogan on a bumper sticker that fades in the sun. Well, no. No, it isn't. Um, some 40 million people died in, um, in World War II. Uh, many, many more than uh, who died in the last 20 years uh, of Islamic terror. But we didn't watch that unfold in real time the way 9-11 did. 9-11 um, was probably the most watched atrocity terrorist attack um, in the history of mankind. Uh, so there's really no excuse for us to uh, um, forget it. I give speeches um, all over the country. I call it 9-11 by the numbers. And I'm not going to do that tonight because we're in New York. And uh, even though there's a lot of New Yorkers who don't know some of the really gruesome details uh, that happened at the Pentagon, in Shanksville, and, in, in, and even at the World Trade Center, I'll give, just give you a couple. 21,817 body parts. World Trade Center. Um, 783 of those weren't found until 2005 and 2006. They were found on the rooftop of the Winter Garden, Andy. They were found in the sewers uh, underneath West Street. Uh, Bush Bank Building. Uh, that, it was not just 16 acres. There are body parts found river to river. And because people were pulverized, um, and in that dust, uh, the dust carried, uh, drifted all the way to Brooklyn. So, of course, it's very ludicrous to people like Andy and I and Rosa uh, for Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf to suggest that because his building is on Park Place, just a few steps away from Fitterman Hall, that had to be torn down because it was so um, full of toxic and organic matter. It's on the same street as the so called Ground Zero Mosque. It is ridicul uh, ridiculous to us to think that um, this is, quote, not near ground zero. 
Um, 200 people approximately jumped from the towers. Only 289 bodies intact. And when I say intact, keep in mind that only five of those could be identified visually. The rest had to be identified by DNA. Um, you all heard 1.8 million tons of rubble. They think you, you, we, the rest of the country thinks of um, you know the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers going down. But it was seven buildings that were destroyed down there. Seven uh, big ones. Um, how tall was Building Seven, Andy? How many floors? Sixty. Yeah, sixty. It's a big building. Uh, the Marriott, twenty-two floors. And then, of course, Deutsche Bank and Fitterman Hall had to be um, destroyed. So it's really, a, you know, an enormous amount of physical destruction. And, and um, the reason I like to talk about those numbers is because I think it's very important to remember that uh, this was an attack that was intended not to just bring about human and physical destruction. They targeted the economic, military, and uh, political uh, symbols of power. Um, it was intended uh, to instill great fear, panic, and confusion. And instead, the American people responded uh, with great compassion, uh, with, in some cases, a, 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 well, I think in, in many, in, probably in most cases, great courage. And here's the one that matters most to me, moral clarity. Yes. People ask me, you know, over and over, I've been asked for 10 years, you know, virtually every interview, do you miss the unity of 9-11? Well, sure, because it was a very special time. Um, people, you know, in, in any uh, great crisis, uh, the essentials are what matter, faith, family, friends, everything else just sort of falls away. Uh, but there was moral clarity, and yes. that is what I miss yes. more than anything. They weren't comparing 9-11 to bridge collapses. Uh, there was no uh, confusion about who hit us and why. And, uh, but there was, right away, an element whispering working that we weren't aware of, that I'm aware of now. And that is Council on American Islamic Relations. Uh, this is a Hamas front group that was founded after a meeting of uh, Muslim Brotherhood groups in Philadelphia in 1993. It was founded to specifically to derail the Oslo Peace Accords. A 9-11 care raised money under the auspices of 9-11 charity, and they sent it to Hamas. That charity was shut down by the Treasury Department. Um, there are a number of Muslim Brotherhood groups, and they were already putting out the message that um, we brought this on ourselves. One of my favorites is um, uh, Osama bin Laden was made in the USA, and that was our friend Imam Faisal Abdul Baruch, who said it on 60 Minutes. And he, he, he caught a lot of grief for that back then, because you didn't say things like that then. Um, ten years later, what I worry about are the political correctness. Uh, we have a, a president now of the United States who just released his national security, uh, his latest national security uh, project. And I don't believe Islamic Jihad, Wahhabism, Salafism, I don't, I don't believe any of those things are named anywhere in there. He only uses the term extremism. And I think that that is very, very dangerous. This is a man who, um, a, a few days or a couple days after Fort Hood, in which um, a major, Nidal Hassan, gave out cards calling himself the soldier of Allah, gave PowerPoint presentations justifying um, the caliphate and, and jihad, and who eventually, as you all know, stood up on the table in one of the most secure military bases in America and opened fire and repeatedly reloaded 
stood on that table yelling al 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 bar. He killed 14, not 13. One of those people hospitalized eventually died. 31 people maimed terribly uh, or injured. And yet, when the president came to minister to those families, the commander in chief, he said that what had happened was, quote, unimaginable. And that made me very angry because it was certainly imaginable to me. I know it was to Rosa, to uh, Councilman Halloran, who lost his uh, cousin. And I think to a lot of Americans, this is what we have to fight, is political correctness. The second thing that I'm worried about is, is free speech. Folks, it is under siege. It is under siege. And I just want to say, did any of you, were any of you struck by the fact that when you had a man down in Florida, this Terry Jones man, a minister, who wanted to burn a Koran, did, any, did it strike any of you as, as incredible that we had General Petraeus in, in command of all our troops in Afghanistan literally get on the phone to, to try and stop this? Remember, a Koran is like any book. It's, it's cardboard and paper. And yet somehow we were, and our media was buying into the idea that by lighting this match and burning it, people were going to die, accepting that conclusion that is being forced on us by our enemies. The same thing that um, Imam Ruf said in an interview with CNN over the mosque. He actually said, you know, I'm worried, Soledad, his, the reporter interviewing him, I'm worried that if this project isn't built, the extremists are going to act, they're going to riot. And you know, America has a very big footprint all over the world. That to me was a threat. Not even a thinly veiled threat. And I do believe that that is one of the things that our cowardly media in this country, not all, uh, but the establishment media, is responding to. This idea that we have to um, essentially appease the enemy. If we're nice to them, if we buy what they're telling us, that jihad is really about inner struggle, when violent jihad is referred to in the, in the Quran, I think 70% of all the references to jihad in the Quran refer to violent war, holy war. Um, so I, I'm very, very worried about that. And I think you, as American citizens, have to be very, very skeptical about what you read in media. Right. When, the, when the mosque issue exploded, um, I wanted to know what this was about. And uh, Tim Brown and I, he's the uh, former Rescue 3 FDNY uh, firefighter who uh, lost 93 of his friends at World Trade Center, we, we actually went and met with the developers uh, of the Ground Zero Mosque, now called Park 51, very secular name. Um, and if we wanted to, you know, I didn't want to prejudge. It was when this first hit, and I wanted to find out what was going on with that. And in fact, I found out that, I said, show us the PowerPoint presentation you've been showing the politicians. The fact they were going to the politicians before they even broached the subject with, with community, much less 9 family members, should tell you everything. They wanted to get public uh, cover, political cover. And Tim uh, filed a lawsuit and a um, FOIA request and actually got the emails back and forth the mayor's office and the developers expressly saying, we need political cover before we unroll, uh, unveil this. But anyway, I said, show us the PowerPoint you're showing even showing the politicians, and they did it. And what I saw was a 15-story building They, where you see put each floor, what's going to be on each floor, and at the bottom, on, on, in the lobby, it said L-O-B-B-Y, and then next to that it said Elevator to Mosque. 
And then on the 15th floor, mosque. The word mosque. And I said, how big is the mosque going to be? And he said, it'll accommodate 2,000 people. That's getting up to, how many does uh, St. Patty's hold? That's a big mosque. And um, I wrote for the incorporation papers to see what they filed with the state as a nonprofit. They don't call it an interfaith community center, they call it an Islamic center. Right. And on their website, it, it was referred to as a mosque. <coughs> Why do Muslims need this mosque? And you had Imam Ralph going out in the community and giving interviews saying that we wanted to leverage our location, our proximity to where 3,000 people died to draw people to Islam. Daisy Khan, his wife, was even try, uh, trying to get the 9-11 uh, the Museum staff to put the, this Cordoba house, is what they called it originally, on the tourist maps given out to people coming to the memorial. The whole purpose of this can be summed up in the title of, the, of Imam Ralph's book, which he published here in the United States under the name What's Right About Islam. In Malaysia and Indonesia, he has offices in Malaysia, he published it under this title, the very same book, A Call to Prayer from the World Trade Center Rubble, Islamic Dawa in the Heart of America, post 9-11. He gave a Friday prayer, and we were sending people into his Friday prayers to hear what he had to say after this thing exploded. And what he said in his Friday prayer was this, I am confident, and I'm quoting him verbatim now, I am confident that the children and grandchildren of those who are opposing us will one day be Muslims. This is about a Dawah project, which is, Dawah means proselytization, it is a pillar of Islam that's required, creating a Muslim community in the heart of America and on top of ground zero. That was a victory loss. That's what this is. And uh, Imam Faisal Abdul Wolf is, I believe, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. He made his book available to two Muslim Brotherhood organizations, um, stamped on the book. Uh, their logos, their web addresses, these, these are two organizations, one of which um, is mentioned in a uh, material support trial, and another which is a, was named as an unindicted co-conspirator in that trial. That is like uh, Martin Luther King uh, giving one of his books to the KKK and saying, use this to recruit. That's what it's like. Um, so I'm very, much, I'm very much worried about the Muslim Brotherhood Project um, in this country. And, um, and, and you should be too. Uh, because they uh, arrived in this country in the mid-60s. Their whole purpose is called Civilization Jihad. Uh, in 2004, one of their high-ranking officials uh, was arrested uh, after an FBI search done on his house. In the floorboards underneath his house, they found the entire Muslim Brotherhood America archive with the entire plan. You can go read this on the internet. Um, about how they plan to infiltrate all of our cultural institutions, our schools, universities, um, our government, and they've been very, very successful at doing that. Because it is these people that the FBI has been going to for Muslim outreach. Not ordinary Muslims who are peaceful, but the leadership of these organizations who have been opposing our law enforcement. Um, and telling their members, don't talk to the FBI. So, and also they've been filtrated all the way up to the White House, and not just this White House, not just the Obama administration, Bush administration too. And do remember, don't let them tell you that you're an Islamophobe, or that you hate Muslims, or that you are bigoted. Because I can tell you, I have Muslim friends who are standing with us, and they're saying, never. We fled Syria. We fled Iran. We left Saudi Arabia because we want to get away from Sharia. We came to the United States because we want economic opportunity and liberty. 
if you guys go down, we have no place left to go. Calling you a bigot and Islamophobe is a way to get you to shut up. That's all that is. Let it roll off your back. And remember that there are Muslims in this country who are praying we succeed in beating these people back. Because they, and I didn't understand this right after 9-11, they cannot, it's much harder for them to go public because they will be intimidated. Their children will be ostracized. The Muslim community is, it's a big deal for them because they've been raised, uh, the Ummah, the Muslim community, is, it's, a, it's a different concept than it is here in, in our secular society. So it's hard for them. We asked one of our friends if, you would, if she would join the, the, one of our lawsuits, and she said, Deborah, I, I wish I could, but I can't. I have kids. That, this is serious. So don't let them do that. And I, I will, I'm going to close now because you've been hearing a lot of speeches and I'll just say that um, I believe that the enduring legacy of 9-11 is the, the heroism, the, the generosity, um, and the courage of the American people. When thousands of our fellow human beings were killed in an act of raw religious extremism, unlike any this country had ever seen. They didn't turn outward with acts of violence or hatred. They turned to each other, I mean, nothing more than American flags. We are a special country. We are a special people. And people come to this country knowing that. A Syrian man said to me, I love this country. And I said, what do you love most? What do you like most? And he answered, he didn't skip a beat. He said, freedom. Freedom. People here don't realize how much freedom you have. Right. He said, the whole world should be the United States of America. So I just want to say thank you. I never would like to uh, miss an opportunity to say thank you to all of you. Because for 9-11 family members, you kept us from great despair that day. You gave us hope. And you help us, you have helped us all these years to carry on. And thank you to Smart Girl Politics. I'm very honored to be honored by you, and I'm thrilled that you're out there plugging away. Thanks.